Good morning, Grace Church. Thank you guys so much for joining us today. Would you all stand up as we begin to worship together?
That is who you are. That is who you are. Sometimes we need to remind ourselves 
of who he is. He is the way maker, the miracle worker. And I know that there's some of us in here who are feeling a heaviness of life, the hardships of life. Feel like you're in darkness. But we serve a God that is as big as we sing about. He keeps his promises. He works miracles. He makes a way when there was no way. He is more powerful than we could even imagine. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go to him in prayer. And if you're one of those people that you're struggling, you're hurting, whatever it is, give it to him. And believe the words we sing. Let's pray. Father God, we love you. We thank you, God, for who you are. God, we are praying for your will to be done. As these requests are lifted up to you, God, just pray that you would move in a miraculous way. We pray for the, the victims of the fires all around us, God, the ones who have lost so much. Pray for your hand of comfort to be on them and their family. For the ones battling illness, God. We pray for your healing hand to move. Father, we love you. And we believe you are a big God. We believe you're a way maker, a miracle worker. We just lift these things up to you. In your son's holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. You go ahead and grab a seat. Check the screens out. Hey there. Welcome to Grace. We're so glad you're here today. If you're new, we'd love to meet you and connect with you and help you get what you need. The best way to do that is for you to text the word connect me with no spaces to 411-247. Just fill out the link we send you and someone will be in touch. A great place to start is the seven minute meeting. It happens just after service. You can meet with a pastor and learn more about what we do here. Just look for the big sign under the balcony in the worship center. Also, there's a pastor team available if you need prayer or just need someone to talk to. Just head out into the foyer and have a seat in one of the pews and someone will come up and pray with you. Pat Barrett is coming to Grace this Thursday for a really awesome worship night. It's not too late to grab tickets for you and all your friends. He sings songs like Build My Life and a couple others that we've done right here on Sundays. You can grab tickets by heading to our website, gracechurchreno.org events. Parents, if you have kids between birth and pre-K, parent-child dedication is for you. It's where we promise to help raise your kids to love Jesus and each other. The next parent-child dedication is next Sunday, September 19th. To get more details or sign up, you can text the word Grace Kids with no spaces to 411 247. We can't wait to celebrate this really special moment with you and your family. Thanks for being here today. So much cool stuff going on. And anybody excited for Pat Barrett? I am. It's going to be an awesome experience. And I just want to say this there, there's nothing better than getting together with your family and worshiping. And we're going to do that this week, and it's going to be awesome. There's still time to get tickets, so go and grab those. And another thing we're doing that we started last week is um, we know that there, there's a lot of people who are hurting uh, in our local hospitals who are struggling. And, but we also believe there's a lot of power in prayer. Amen? And so we thought we would just get to the hospitals and start to pray over them. And last week, teams went out last Tuesday and prayed over the local hospitals. There was a team at Renown and St. Mary's, and they just began to pray. And we're continuing that for the whole month of September. It's going to happen every Tuesday night at 7 o'clock. And if you want to be a part of that, if you want to come with us and join a team to go pray, you just got to text the word prayer nights to 411247. All one word prayer nights, text it to 411247. You get all the info, and it's an amazing experience. Uh, I'm actually leading a team next week that's going to be at one of the hospitals, so that's going to be awesome. And um, we can continue to do this and make an impact in the city because as a church, uh, you continue to give uh, and give generously. 
And every week we put a slide up on the screen and just give you the opportunity to go to God and seek him in this way, uh, the ways you might be stepping into this. Uh, and we're going to do that now, and then we'll continue with worship. Would you all stand with me as we just continue to worship God?
please have a seat? You guys grab a seat. In John chapter 8, verses 2 through 11, we read an amazing story. An amazing story about Jesus. And what happens here is Jesus was traveling and he was teaching. And while he was teaching, it says that a crowd gathered around him to hear him. And in that crowd, there were some religious leaders of the time. And they went and found this woman who had been caught in adultery. And they bring her to Jesus. And they ask Jesus, the law says we should kill her for her crimes. See, they're trying to trick Jesus here. They're trying to get him to say something that will turn the people against him. They're trying to get him to act in a way that will turn people against him. But Jesus, what he does is he bends down and starts to write. Right in the sand with his finger. And he stands up. And it says one by one, they began to leave. They began to leave one by one. Until it was just Jesus and this woman. And Jesus asked her some very powerful words. He says, who is still here to condemn you? Her response, no one. Jesus replies, then either do I, but go and sin no more. So the question we're going to look at today is, what does that story have to do with me? And what does that story have to do with you? And I believe it has everything to do with us. And so let's just bow and pray and just ask the Lord to really work. Father, thank you, Lord, for this day. And thank you, Lord, for just the privilege we have, Lord, today to look at this story from your word, God. And I pray that, God, that you would just take my words today and whoever's discouraged would be encouraged. And, God, whoever needs to be convicted would be convicted. And whatever your will is, God, I just surrender myself to you and pray that, God, that you would have your perfect will in and through our lives. And I thank you for that in Jesus' holy and powerful and awesome name. Amen. So what does this woman's story have to do with our story? The reality is, is that her story in truth is our story. We, listen to this carefully, were condemned by God without hope and without mercy until Jesus came along and gave us his grace. And so what we're going to look at today is how then do I take the same grace that God has given to me and give it to other people? That's what we're going to look at today. How do I become grace-based like Jesus? Because that's God's intent. God wants me to, to act just like Jesus. He wants me, by the power of his Spirit, to live in such a way that everywhere I go, grace is poured out. That's God's intent for my life and for your life. And I want to just start by reading the last part of this section of Scripture, and then we're going to jump right into it. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to the woman, Where are those your accusers? Has no one condemned you? And she said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. So in reality, do you understand that you deserve... Because of your sin, do you understand that you deserve the same death that she was deserving? Do you understand that? Based on Scripture, because of what Scripture says, we have all fallen short of the glory of God and the wages of sin is death. So I deserve death just like she deserved death. But Jesus gave his life for us that we might be forgiven and and have this awful penalty removed, having established then that Jesus led with grace... How then do I do that? That's what we're going to look at. That's the most important thing for me to look at today is this is who Jesus was and is, but the reality is is that this is what Jesus wants for my life too. So how do I do that? That's a complicated question, right? How do I live in a world that is filled with anger and division and mistrust and hatred? How do I live in a world with the grace of God pouring out of my life? Because would you admit that we live in an age that's marked by anger and resentment and distrust? Would you agree with that? 
Okay, with that as the backdrop, let me show you how you and I can live in a way that will honor and glorify God in this grace-based way. So I'm going to give you about four or five principles, and I, I hope and pray and trust that you'll be able to take some of these and put them into your life, and especially the first one that I'm going to talk about. I think the first thing that I've got to understand is that if I'm going to pour out grace in my life, humility has to be my focus. I need to focus on my own humility before God. So Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 5, God, listen to this, let this soak in, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. So humble yourselves under the mighty power of God. So my responsibility then here is to humble myself under the mighty power of God. Of God, I am, to, I am to humble myself. So then the million dollar question is, how does, how does that work? How do I do that? And I think the most important thing you can do is that you can remember God's grace in your life. That's where you start. How do I humble myself under God? I remember what God, I remember the work that God has done in and through me. And his work is twofold. So let me just explain it to you or remind you of it either way. First of all, his, his, his work is twofold. First of all, he saved a wretch like me. Honestly, he, can you say that about yourself? He saved a wretch like me. I did not deserve it. He didn't look down in heaven and go, man, I need Dan on my team. I think I'm going to draft him in you know, my fantasy football league, and I'm going to draft him, and I'll put him in. That's not how it worked at all. He pulled me from the bottom of the barrel, literally from the bottom of the barrel, and in reality, that's where you came from too. That's the bottom line in your life is that we just need to understand how, how bad we are and were, were before Christ. So the reality is this for your life. If you, if you believe that, and I think this is what we typically do, we typically tend to forget the amazing grace that God poured out in our life. And the depth of our own sin, even for those of you that were raised in the church, listen to me carefully, you were born as an enemy of God and how you acted out, how you lived your life out, really exposed the very nature of your sinfulness. So the first thing is, is that I've got to recognize that God saved a wretch like me. The second thing that I need to recognize is everything that I have, everything that I have, everything that I am is based on his grace. All of, my, all of my talent comes from him, if I have any. I mean, I hope I have some. All of, all of my riches come from him. All of my circumstances, my job, my personality, every circumstance in life comes from the hand of God. So if that is the case, then, if I recognize that, recognize that I don't have anything that I didn't receive. That's what Paul said in 1 Corinthians. Paul said, I don't have anything that I did not receive then what that does is that by reminding yourself of that, it, it really makes you humble. No one here today, I don't care whether you are a surgeon or a janitor, not that those are different in God's eyes. I don't care what the level of skill you have in your life or what your job requires. You don't have anything that didn't come from God himself. And every door that God has opened in your life, he opened and not you. He was the architect behind your life. That's what the scripture says. And so um, you need to humble yourself before God. You need to recognize that you are not more important than anybody else. That your stature in life means nothing to God. That he's not impressed by your talent. He's not impressed because he gave it to you. Didn't come from you. Everything you have comes from him. So what I need to do is just recognize that every day and live accordingly. Humble myself before God. There's, I have a, a favorite author. This guy doesn't necessarily write to Christians. I believe he is one, but I don't think he necessarily has a Christian audi audience. And his name is Jim Collins, and he writes about leadership. And I love everything he writes. He's really good. And in his writings on leadership, he describes that the highest kind of leader, he calls this leader a level five leader. The highest kind of leader has two ingredients that are non-negotiable in his life or her life. A level five leader has two things. Number one, a level five leader always puts the mission that they've been called to above their own personal circumstances. 
That's a level five leader. That's rare for us to find today because most of us are asking the question, and what's in it for me? But a level five leader, and the ultimate level five leader is Jesus, by the way. Jesus was a level five leader where he put the mission in front of his own personal needs. And the other thing that Jim Collins says is that, he, that the level five leader puts others' needs in front of his own. Those two things. I put the mission and others as more important than myself. And that, in, my, in the age that we live, doesn't preach well. I don't get a lot of standing ovations by saying that. <clears throat> you know, the bottom line, it's not about you. It's never been about you. It'll never be about you. It will never be about you. It's always been about him. And if I'm going to become a level five leader like Jesus and lead with grace, I've got to put the mission as more important than myself, and I've got to put others as more important than me. Paul said it many ways in, in many sa- sections of Scripture, but That's what we're all called to. You and I are called to live like Jesus. Jesus was a level five leader. You are a leader whether you you like it or not. You're leading everybody. Somebody's watching you. So let's be level five leaders. And we are level five leaders when we humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God, under his power, and live for the sake of the mission and live for the sake of other people. The second principle. And it gets better as we go along. The number two thing that I, I see as a, someone who is going to give grace out and be a person who just exudes grace is number two, is that you've got to find ways to forgive and not judge. You've got to find ways to forgive and not judge, right? And I think we're, I'm, I'm a great judger. I, you know, one to ten scale, I, I'm a ten. You know, I can judge you just like that. You know, I can, I can see everything wrong with you. I mean, I'm great at criticizing. I'm, I mean, I, I have this eye for what's wrong in your life. I just can't see what's wrong in my life, right? Does that sound familiar? And so what I've got to learn to do is I learn to, if I'm going to be a grace-based in my life, if I'm going to live like Jesus, I've got to find ways to forgive and not to judge. Do you remember what Jesus prayed for from the cross when he was on the cross and his enemies were out there mocking him? He says, Father, forgive them for their little twerps. Is that what he said? He didn't say that at all, right? He said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. Jesus led by forgiving, which brings us to a really interesting thing. You all know who Eugene Peterson is. You know, Eugene Peterson, he uh, was one that wrote um, a, a portion of the Bible and a really great author as well. And uh, this is what he says on forgiveness. He says, There is a folklore about forgiveness, and this is what it is, is that the offender is to seek forgiveness from the offended. That's a folklore. That's not how Jesus modeled it for us. In the Jesus model, in God's model, who was the one offended? It was God, right? God was the offended. And so the one who was offended emptied himself of the right to be regarded as God humbled himself under the mighty hand of God and pursued reconciliation with the people that sinned against him. That's the model that Jesus left with you and I. And here's how we typically do it. We get offended and we think, you know, I'm just waiting for that person to seek my forgiveness. I, I, that person, listen to this. I don't mean to offend anybody here. Yeah, actually I do. But that's another story altogether. Here's the deal is that, is that we typically think this is that we think about that person who has offended us saying, and maybe you've said this, they owe me an apology. Really? They do. Was that Jesus' model? Jesus emptied himself of that. And he sought, he sought us in reconciliation. It is so powerful. You and I, you and I live in an, an upside-down world. The things that are right in the eyes of the world are wrong in the sight of God. So we've got to be the ones. This is what God, if I'm going to be grace-based, I pursue after those who have, have offended me for the purposes of reconciliation, to offer grace to their life. That's what I'm called to do. And that doesn't fly well. I mean, I'm, I don't hear any amens, Pastor Dan. I don't, you know, I'm not, nobody's standing up going, yeah, man, yeah, baby, preach that stuff. I mean, because most of us are thinking, yeah, that person that cut me off in the freeway, oh, God. 
We pray that impe- you know, imprecatory psalm that says, God, smash their bones. Where's, you know, have you ever thought this when you're driving down the freeway and somebody kind of cuts you off and you, know, you have to slam on the brakes, they pull in? My favorite is on, you know, on 80 when you have to merge into 395 and, you know, and, and people go right to the front of the line and it, you know, put their blinker on if that's you. I'm not going to pray an impeccatory psalm over you. I'm just, saying, I'm just saying, in my spirit, in my soul, in the depth of my humanness, what I want to do is I want to let a curse word out. <laughs> say, how dare you? But what I, I'm called to do is saying, oh, yeah, here's the space. Come on now. Come on now. I mean, I'm just telling you the truth here. I'm just telling you the Jesus way, the better life, the good life that the Bible talks about. And it is such an amazing way to live. So God the offended makes the first move and continues with unrelenting effort to get us to accept his forgiveness. That's the God that we serve. That's the God of the New Testament. It's so good. It's so powerful. When God pursues us, by the way, and makes the offer of forgiveness, if I were you, I'd run to God, right? (laughs) I would run to God. When God makes the offer of forgiveness, I'd run to him. My favorite Christian song is Run to the Father. I just love that song. I listen to it nearly every day. I know that's fanatic, but I I just love this song. Um, He says, my heart needs a surgeon. The the, the artist says that. My heart needs a surgeon. My soul needs a friend. That's exactly what God did to a sinner. (laughs) A sinner like me is he did surgery in my heart, and then he made his enemy his friend. That's the nature of who God is. Once we receive this forgiveness, then we should be relentless, aggressive in the process of forgiving and moving towards reconciliation with everybody that has offended us. Amen, right? That was a weak amen. Oh, man. But here's the reality is, listen to this. Forgiveness is, the, is deepest when it is initiated by the offended. It's the deepest when it's initiated by the offended. That is why Christ being crucified on a cross, offering forgiveness is the most powerful image of forgiveness in the universe. If you've never received that forgiveness, by the way, today would be a great day to do that. Third principle, and this gets better as we go along. If I'm going to be grace-based, what I have to do is I have to reject shame as a motivator in my own life and in the life of others. So this is where it's going to get a little uncomfortable for just a few minutes. I'm going to just tell you, I'm going to start by simply saying that my generation, baby boomer generation, is a generation that was raised on shame. And we, it's in our souls. It's in, our, it's in our mindset. And our parents, oftentimes, when we would be bad little boys and girls, our parents oftentimes would say, shame on you. Anybody here have somebody in authority say that to your life? Yeah, yeah, you're, you're the boomer generation. I'm just saying, or the result of the boomer generation. Now boomers are parents and grandparents, and, and I'm a recovering boomer, okay? <laughs> I am. I'm recovering from the process. And I'm just going to tell you, shame is a very destructive force in our lives. And there's a part of shame in all of us. So let me just describe what shame does. Shame produces a deep feeling of being worthless. When I feel shame, I feel separated from God, not drawn to Him. Shame is a very destructive thing. Recent research tells us that shame motivates people to withdraw from relationships and become isolated. Moreover... The shame tend to feel humiliated and disapproved by others, which can lead to, listen to this, which can lead to hostility and even fury. Think about it in this context. We live in a culture that people pick up guns and they go into shopping malls and shoot people. I mean, I I don't understand that, except for the fact that maybe there's something going, something inside of them that's going on that I don't understand some deep shame that creates fury in their life. And by the way, if you have an anger problem, smile when I say this to you. If you have an anger problem or you're married to someone with an anger problem or you have somebody in your family that has an anger problem, their problem is probably not anger. It's probably shame that expresses itself in anger. Anger is just the symptom 
of something far deeper inside of our lives. Numerous studies link shame with a desire to punish others. When angry, shamed individuals are more likely to be aggressive or self-destructive. Level of suicide in our culture is rising as we speak because we are ashamed. We, we have levels of shame that the grace of God has an answer for, but we're not giving it to people. Psychiatrist Peter Loder states that people cover up or compensate for deep feelings of shame with attitudes of contempt. Sometimes it comes out, he says, as superiority, domineering, or bullying. You show me a bully, and I'm going to probably show you somebody who is shame based in their life. Self depreciating or obsessed with perfectionism. All those things are part of the culture that you and I live in. But what I want to suggest to you that the root of the issue is a shame based thinking in our life that is destructive. And the answer, the answer is the grace of God. And if I have been speaking to you today, if you have discovered that maybe, oh, oh, gosh, that hurt a little bit, and uh, maybe that there's some things going on in your life like depression or anxiety, those things sometimes are symptoms of a deeper thing. Maybe where you should start is with the idea of, oh, I need to do some shame mining in my life and get it out so that I can, so that I can really really experience all that God has for me. If you're interested in doing that, and all of God's people said, yeah, I think I would be. I would give you, I would give you, I'm going to give you the recommendation of an author. And uh, she has everything she writes is gold. From my, I, everything that I've writ, read from her has been gold. Her name is Brene Brown. And uh, she is the foremost expert in America on shame-based thinking. And so whatever book you can get, that's her name on the screen, by the way. It's not mine. It's hers. <laughs> so if shame-based doesn't work, what does? The answer is grace. Grace poured out lavishly by God and by you and I. Fourth principle is stop comparing because all that does, if I compare, it produces competitiveness with you. And so I'm not going to be able to give you grace when you need grace. If I'm competing with you, it is kind of destructive. So Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 says, this is so good. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that, shows, that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up, and let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, not on one another, on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. So if I'm going to give grace to you, I can't be in competition with you. i got to think that your needs are more important than my needs if I'm going to pour grace out in your life. Try this in a marriage sometime. It works, friends. It really does. It really does. Have you ever heard of a thing called cow envy? I'm explaining to you. I'm making this up, but I'm going to explain to you cow envy here today. Two cows in a field, and they're grazing a pasture when they see a milk truck pass by. On one side of the truck, there were the words pasteurized, homogenized, standardized, vitamin A added, and one cow looks to the other cow in size and makes this statement. Makes, it says, he says, makes you feel sort of inadequate, doesn't it? She says that, actually. Makes you, makes you feel kind of inadequate, right? That's the culture that you and I live in. We live in an age where we get on Facebook and I look at your family and I go, good night. How come I don't have a family like that? I mean, I look at all these beautiful people, you know, on Facebook and I'm going, oh, gosh. You know, how, and we compare each other all the time and what it's doing is creating more isolation and more lack of uh, integrity, I would say, in our lives. And I just think that one of the roots of that is comparison. And just understand this. Here's a newsflash. There is somebody, there is somebody that is stronger and smarter and prettier than you. It's me. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. It's not me. I would just sing if you're paying attention. It's not me. Disregard that. Reel that, reel that back in. But the reality is, is that when I look on social media, I see people at their best, don't I? I see people at their best, not at their worst. 
and it creates a false sense. And then I begin to compare what's going on in my life with their life, and pretty soon I'm in the dumps because, because of comparison. So if I'm going to be a person that receives God, God's grace and a person who gives it out, I've got to get out of the comparison game. Last principle. Make sure that you are not a rule-based Christian. Let me say that one more time to you. Make sure that you're not a rule-based Christian. So, smile at me. Let's just be honest here today. How many would be honest enough to say, you know, I tend towards the rules. You know, come on now, raise your hand. I'm a kind of a rule person. Well, look at me in the eyes and listen to about what I'm about to say to you. Those of you who raised your hand, the rest of you who didn't, just bear with me for just a second. Jesus had two rules. Love God and love others. That was it. Jesus had two rules, love God and love others. And that's how we should do it because the problem is, is that the more rules that I have, the more rules that I have, the more I bind myself up and I bind others around me up. And this is, this, is, this is free. I didn't tell, you the, tell this to the early services. Sometimes I do a little consulting with other churches. And um, I don't know why, because I've messed this church up a lot. So, <laughs> so I, don't know, I don't know why. But you know, one of the interesting things is, is the first thing, when someone asked me to you know, just do a little consulting with them, the first thing that I asked for is their bylaws. Do you know why? Because the thicker they are, the more problems they have. Because they write a rule in relationship to every time we've ever had a problem, let's just write a rule about that. You know, stop this, stop that, stop this, stop that. And I'm going to just simply say the law, the Old Testament law, never had the power to restrain people's bad behavior. It just didn't. The grace of God does. That's what Paul says. The grace of God teaches me to deny ungodliness and worldly lust and to live soberly and righteously in this present age. The grace of God gives me the power to live the way that God wants me to live. It's not rules. And this is, this is what I would say to you. Listen to this very carefully. You know, I love, for those of you that know me, you know that I, I love football. This is my favorite time of year. Not when, the, not when the leaves turn, but when they put helmets on and start hitting each other. That's my, that's my favorite time of the year. And uh, I, I've just been that way since I was young. And, and sorry if you're not a football fan, sorry, but this is a great illustration, so I'm going to give it to you anyway. Football, or that from, for, for that matter, any other sport, is not about the rules. <laughs> it's not. I've never seen an umpire or a referee get a standing ovation for a call they made. <laughs> they don't put it on TV and put it in slow motion. You know, he's, he's running, he pulls out the flag, you know, he throws it up, and, you know, they, just, they, you know, they don't show it five or six or seven times because the object of the game is not the rules. That just allows you to play the game. And I want to say the same thing is true in relationships as well, Right? The object of the relationship isn't about rules. The more, the more rules you have with one another, the, the le- I'm going to say the less grace you have and the less grace you have, the less love you have inside the relationship. God knows what he's doing. It's grace. It's grace. I've got to let God teach me to be gracious in every way. That's what God's call for my life is. That's what God's call for your life is. It is to let me to be like, I want to be like Jesus. Let me be like Jesus. And to be like Jesus, I need to, I need to be with that woman that was caught in adultery. And I, I wonder, why didn't they bring in the husband? I mean, come on now. Why was it the woman? They were both caught. But they brought the, I don't get that. Maybe that's another, another sermon altogether. But, but, you know, it's kind of weird that they brought the woman in and then they said, hey, Jesus, by the way, we caught this woman in adultery and I want to be that guy that gets down on my knees and writes something in the sand. I have no idea what Jesus wrote. But I do know what he said when he got up. Anybody here got no sin in their life? I want to be that guy that just pours grace into people who are struggling in life, who are just struggling to try to figure out how do I live the Christian life. I want to be that guy that just pours grace out, not who heaps shame 
and says, I told you so. Told you not to do that. Told you this is what would happen in your life. Those are all shameful words. Jesus calls us to pour grace. I don't think you can lose here. I don't. Because the person who was caught, this person, this lady caught in adultery, already knew her sin. I, Jesus didn't have to say a word to her about her sin. She already knew her sin. All he needed to do was offer grace. And that's what you and I are called to do. That's the kind of lifestyle that when that guy cuts us off in the freeway, we just say, hey, it's your space. Or in the parking lot here at Grace Church. <laughs> you know, pre, especially pre-pandemic stuff, when you know, in the parking lot was packed out, you know, and now a lot of people are with us online. But before then, I mean, it was sometimes, it was sometimes, I mean, people sometimes, I'm just going to be honest, sometimes cussed at each other. Getting out of the parking lot after saying, praise Jesus. You know, <laughs> I think I just sang in front of the church. I don't know. That was probably a mistake on my part. You get, you get what I'm saying? This is kind of crazy. We live in an upside down world. And the way we write this world, and I'm going to tell you what this world is looking for. I mean, you would agree that this world is filled with hate and division and suffering. And I'm going to tell you, if the church just started being grace people, you wouldn't find a seat on Sunday mornings because that's what people are looking for. They're not looking for another rule. They're looking for grace. They just don't know that that's the word that they're looking for. So let us, would you, let's just have a restart here. Should we do that? Because all of us probably haven't been really great at grace. So one, two, three, go. Let's just restart it. And can we just from this day forward say, to the best of my ability, by the power of Christ in me, I'm just going to be a grace-based person. That's what I want. I might fall. I might stumble. I might mess up. When I do, I'll just say, hey, sorry about that. That was the wrong response. Let me pour some grace on your life. Isn't that great? I mean, is, wouldn't that be a great thing to do? Are you in? Are you in? Come on. Are you in? So, with that thought in mind, I'm done preaching. Shane, I don't know about Shane. He's going to come out here in just a minute and he might preach another message. I don't know. What, I, he's uncontrollable. I can't control him. But, you know, but no, we're almost done here. But I'm done preaching. I'm going to pray and then I'm going to show you one quick video of some things that, were, that are coming down the pike at Grace that are brand new, br new branding for some things. And so, please don't leave until after, you've, after you have um, watched the video. And if you do... Next weekend, I'm going to sing a full song. Make you sit there. Listen to me sing. So, Father, thank you for this day. Thank you, Lord, for your grace in our lives. And may we be those people that pour grace out in others. In Jesus' name, amen. Grace is starting something new. Next week, Pastor Dan launches a new series called come home where he explains that home is about far more than a location it's about relationship and community and it's how god designed us to live in keeping with that we're launching something new called home groups and our entire small group system is rebranding we have over 70 groups where people will be placed where they can come together learn about the bible and grow closer to jesus together Home groups will be put together based on people's schedules and their life stage, so we're praying that your group will feel like family very, very soon. Groups will study the Bible together and then they'll go out and put the word into action. They'll take communion together, pray together, do service projects together, basically do life together. This is a great next step for you to move closer to Jesus and to sign up, all you need to do is text the word home group with no spaces to 411-247. That's home group with no spaces to 411-247. For the next three weeks, we'll be putting these groups together and the groups will start meeting in the month of October and doing all kinds of things together. Groups will meet all over the region. Some will meet in homes, some will meet here on campus, some will meet at Starbucks. Basically, it doesn't matter where you meet, it's who you meet with. I know that God's gonna do something amazing in this church as we connect in this way so sign up for home groups. Come on, jump in. Just text the word home group 
with no spaces to 411247. And let's just see what God does. Exciting stuff, excited for home groups. Life change happens in groups, so sign up for one if you're not in one yet. Right over here, we have our seven minute meeting. She's got her sign. Hold up real high so everybody sees it. If you're a guest with us today, we'd love to connect with you. You can head over there. You get to hear from Pastor Dan and why we exist as a church. And also, we have a prayer team ready to pray with you out in the pews. All you got to do is go out and grab a seat in one of the pews, and they'll come to you. Other than that, we love you guys. We'll see you next week.